behind me in math class, he sat behind me in reading class, and for whatever reason, he enjoyed taking a rubber band, pulling it back, and just snapping me in the middle of my time. And at this moment in time, I was not the most confident person in the world, so I took the constant rubber band bullying. I wanted to turn around and pop him, but I didn't. I wanted to say something to the teacher, but I didn't. I wanted to make a scene, but because part of I was scared of what the teacher might do if I did, I didn't. There was a whole lot of doubt, so I let him be the seventh grade rubber band bully. Because in my mind, if I would have fought him, I would not have won. Because I felt like I would be underdog because I was undermatched or overmatched. A lot of times we go through life and we feel lower than our surroundings. We create or we go through situations where we feel like they're underdog. Part of that has to do with doubt. Part of that has to do with fear. Part of that has to do with lack of confidence. Or we think we need something else. And until we find what that something else is, we don't want to encounter anyone who might be bigger, badder, or even situations or giants that we might face. Today, our subject is how do we pull the underdog upset? How do we pull the underdog upset? We are in the book of Judges. We're going through our cover to cover series where we are surveying the 14 narrative movements of the Bible, the 14 C's. Creation, chaos, covenant, crossing the country, cutting, captivity, comeback, calm, Christ, cross, conquer, or come back to church, and then conclusion. And that's the 14 narrative movements, the 14 storyline movements of the Bible. And as we are going through those 14 storyline movements, the reason we need to know this, okay, I get to ask, why do we need to know the storyline of the Bible? Well, if you don't understand the storyline, if you don't understand the movements and what's happening in any section, when you read the Bible, you will interpret it and apply it incorrectly. So for us to be able to interpret and apply the Bible correctly, we need to understand the storyline of the Bible from cover to cover. As we've been going through this, we are in the country section. We are in the book of Judges. As we go through each book, we highlight the words or phrases. The words or phrases from the book of Judges the cycles of sin. Cycles of sin. Every main character we encounter in this book is going to go through this cycle of sin. What is the cycle? Sin, <coughs> slavery, supplication, savior, stability, and then repeat. We're going to see this over and over as we go through the characters in the book. As we've been through the judges, we started with Caleb and Othanel. There's our tag team that kind of started it. Caleb was the last man standing. He was the dude that came out of Israel, came out of Egypt with the Israelites across the Red Sea with Moses. He's the last dude standing. He dies in the book of Judges. Ehud, who was the left-handed guy who killed the fat king. Shamgar, the furious farmer. that just got to get one verse, but we get so much in that one verse. Deborah, and then we've been in Gideon for the last few weeks. As we've been looking at the character of Gideon, the judge Gideon, here's been the Gideon lessons. One, we said when God sees us, he doesn't see us from where we are. He sees us from what we can become. God sees our Potential. We said that whenever it comes to signs, it's not about the signs, it's about the search for God's will. Today we are in part three, we're jumping into chapter seven of the Judges, and I'm going to warn you beforehand, okay? As I read this passage, as I even taught at the 8 o'clock service, I found so much weird humor in this passage, I'm going to share it as I teach it, and if you've been around me long enough, you know I'm quirky. I am honoring. I apologize. Some of you have accepted me. Thank you very much. I accepted my <laughs> Some of you who are still kind of questioning may not be here next week. That's the way this works. I get it. We're in chapter 7, verses 133. It says this. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Hera. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moriah. The Lord said to Gideon, no takers, that's a key phrase. In chapter 7, the Lord said to Gideon, it's going to be seen over and over and over again. So we know that God is directing everything in this passage. You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, for Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. So remember the story. When we met Gideon, he was kind of hiding out in a wine drink. Threshing wheat, not in the threshing floor, in the wine press, pretty much hiding. He did not want the Midianites to come and uh, steal the food or even, so he's kind of hiding for his life. And then the angel of the Lord shows up and says, hey there, mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, who me? And then he goes, yeah, you. And we are, God's going to 
the wine press to the threshing floor. Now we're in the process of moving from the wine press to the threshing floor to the battlefield. Okay, that's the storyline for Gideon. And he has been told twice in chapter 6, you will win this fight. You will win this fight. You are going to defeat the Midianites. But you know what? He doesn't believe it yet. He does not believe it yet. So we're in this kind of valley. We're getting ready to go fight the Midianites because that's his whole purpose. And he's there. And then God says, hey, you've got too many people. And he has 32,000. He has 32,000 people. And God says, hey, you have too many people because if you went and fought the Midianites with 32,000, they might think they're the reasons that won and not me. And Gideon's like, I didn't think we had enough. I think we needed more. And then God goes, so now announce to them, announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remain. So they're in this congregation. They're waiting to go fight. God says, hey, Gideon, you tell them if anyone is scared, they don't have to fight. It's in the book of Deuteronomy and one of Moses' sermons. He told them that. If you are scared, you don't have to fight. You shouldn't fight. And the leader should not make them fight. So he goes, okay, if any of you are too scared, just get up and leave. And 22,000 goes, peace, and left. <laughs> 22,000 left because they were scared. Sometimes fear causes us not to fight. Fear causes us to succumb to doubt. Fear causes us not to have enough faith in God. There was a six-year-old boy named Josh. And Josh was sitting at like, the dining room table with his mom. And his mom goes, hey, Josh, go into the pantry and get me a can of soup. And Josh looked over at the pantry. And the pantry was just absolutely dark. And Josh was scared of the dark. So Josh told his mama, Mom, I don't want to go into the pantry. It's too dark, and I am scared of the dark. And his mom says, Josh, you know that Jesus is with you. He is with you wherever you are going. He even goes before you. You're going to be okay. So Josh gets up. He slowly walks over to the pantry, and he stops. Leans in just a little bit. He goes, hey, Jesus, if you're in there, can you hand me a can of soup? <laughs> Sometimes fear prevents us from taking that step. We had 22,000 people that chose to leave Gideon, and there's only 10,000 left. Verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, there's still too many of them. You know, Gideon's like, what? I just let 22,000 leave. I was going to win now. You keep taking my army away. Lord, I don't know about this. I don't know if this is going to work. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. Pretty much pretend like they're taking them down to the river, a creek, or something. If I say this shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. And here's the picture in my head. Gideon's like, okay, you 10,000 that are left, single file line. We are going to the water fountain. And they are going and they are going, verse 5 and 6. So he brought the people down to the water, down to the river. I wish they would have used the word river. Because it's like that. And the Lord said to Gideon, there's our key phrase, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink, and the number of those who laughed, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. So think about this. So you got a dog. And when a dog wants to drink the water, you got the water kind of going. Okay. So back in the day, the normal way, now notice this, the normal way to drink out of a river, the normal way to drink out of a creek was this. Just like a dog. So God says, Gideon, single follow line, go to the river. The ones who get down like this, you're going to send them home. I'm thinking, I bet I don't want them to fight with me anyway if they drink water like that. But the other option is they're going to go to the river. They're going to bend down. Do 
that with me. I like to refresh your sentence. <laughs> See, the ones who go, they get to go fight with you. Here's the bad part, though. Only 300 did that. So out of 10,000 who were left, we're now left with 300 men. Verse 7 and 8. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lack, I will save you and give you the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300. And then they're getting ready to go to fight this battle. And you're thinking about this. Man, we started with 32,000. Then we dropped to 10,000. Now we're all the way down to 300 men. And Gideon didn't have confidence with the 32. Do you think he's going to have confidence with the 300? Say no. Oh. No, it's going to be a little rough for Gideon as he goes to this battle. But here's the lesson God's teaching us. As we slowly look at the story, is that God can do a lot with a little. God is going to be able to do a lot with a little. Ooh. Next part of the verse. Verse 12. How many people? Okay. What does it actually look like? So we know we have 300 Gideon or 300 Israelites. Who are they going against? How many people are they facing? Verse 12. The Midianites and the Amalekites, they joined together. They're like a tag team bad guys. And all the other Eastern people had settled in the valley. Think as locusts. Their camels would no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. So we have 300 versus an uncountable amount. 300 versus an uncountable amount. So in Gideon's head, it looks like this. It's about to get Old Testament here. And that's kind of what Gideon's thing is. Oh, no. We're going to go fight the sleep. But there's one thing. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to get it into your hands. He's already told them this over and over. You're going to win. You're going to win. You're going to win. Gideon still doesn't believe it. He has not fully accepted that he's going to win. If you are afraid to attack him, Gideon go, yeah, I'm still afraid. Go down to the camp with your servant, Korah. And listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Purah, his servant, went down to the outpost again. So you have Gideon. He's got 300 men. He's getting ready to fight. He still doubts himself. And in reality, he's doubting God. And he's sitting there going, I don't know. I don't know. So God again comes to him. Okay, Gideon, if you're scared, take your buddy and go down and listen to what's going on in the camp. So God takes his buddy, they go down to the camp, and here's what they find out verse 12 14. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream. He was saying, a round leaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed it. So this is like going to his buddy. Oh, I had a dream. There was a roll that was rolling. It rolled through the camps, and it killed us all. And then we get the interpretation. This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hand. So this blows me away. Think of Gideon. All the encounters that we've had, right? So God comes to him in a wine phrase and says, hey, Gideon. You are my mighty warrior. I don't know if I believe that, Lord. You know, maybe I need a sign. Well, here, go get some bread and a sacrifice and put it there. So he does it. And then, like, fire from the sky comes down and just consumes on it. And Gideon goes, okay. And then he goes, I still don't believe it. So he goes, okay, let, let's do this, this golden fleece or this fleece. Let it be wet. Okay. Okay. Now let it be dry and hold ground to it. So you know, sign one, 
sign two, sign three. Now we get like sign four, this tree. And in my mind, the effort that God is putting into Gideon to get him ready to go fight the Midianites is absolutely crazy. Now, in my world, I think what gives up. Or maybe he's just kicking him in the rear. Like God's over here and Gideon's here. Hey, I need you to go fight. Hey, here's, here's like a, a fire-consuming flesh. Okay, here's like the fleece is wet. Here's like the ground. Now, finally, we get to the dream. Hey, here's like a dream. And take this dream for what it is. The dude already believes that they're going to be defeated. So the enemy already thinks they're going to lose, right? So he goes, boom. And at this point, Gideon is finally ready to fight. And here's my question to us. How many times... Does God have to kick us in the rear before we turn around and fall? How many times did God have to kick us in the rear to get our attention before we decide, okay, God, I'm turning you, kicking me, I'm going to follow you? Too many. And that's one of the lessons we get from Gideon. But it's at this point, throughout the whole thing, when we study Gideon, Gideon gets so much guidance. So much assurance from God that he is the character with the most doubt. Gideon gets the most assurance and guidance from God, but he has the most doubt. The lesson, God still uses Gideon. Despite the doubt, God still uses Gideon. And despite your doubt, despite my doubt, despite us thinking that we are under oath, God can still use us because he used Gideon. Now the story gets fun. Verse 15. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down in worship. And in my mind, I think, dude, what took you so long? I mean, it took you like a chapter and a half, almost two chapters, to finally just go, okay, God, I'll do what you want. It took forever for him to get there. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up! The Lord has given the Midianites camp into your hand, which he told you like 20 verses ago he was going to do. God is the God of the underdogs. God is the God of the underdogs. And to have the blessing and the support of God is always key. In the Bible story, Gideon finally learns it. You should learn it. Even Rocky knew it. The best underdog ever. Picture. This is like at the end of chapter 7, 
The 300 dudes who are with Gideon are the overweight Friday night beer drinkers who are just ready to fight. And they're like, we're ready. Let's go. <laughs> Verse 20. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed their jars, grasping their torches in their left hand and holding in their right hands their trumpets. They were to blow and shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Pause for a second. The only thing wrong here is probably what they shouted. A sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. They're kind of putting equality with Gideon. So maybe they didn't quite get it. But the picture that you get, they throw down their glass. They've got their torches in their left hand. They've got their trumpet in their right. And they are ready to fight. So they go, ah! And as they go and fight, now notice that they don't have a sword. They have a trumpet and a torch. Like, that's what they're going to go fight with. So it's like they get them in there. So they get up. So they're like, Day. Following Jesus 
believing the gospel is not just a one-time thing. It's not just something you do to get you to go to heaven. It's not something you do just to get you out of hell. It's a life change because you are a new creation from the moment you believe in Jesus. From the moment you believe in Jesus. Eternal life doesn't happen when you die. It happens when you accept Jesus. And it's in that moment that you can tap in to the power of a God that is bigger than everything we will ever encounter. That's one of the lessons from Gideon, but it's one of the challenges we face day in, day out. Father, we pray that as we examine the life of Gideon, how you saw his potential, and despite his doubt, despite his desire for a sign, even though he searched for your will, you still used him to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Midianites. We pray that despite our doubt, that you will continue to assure us, continue to guide us, continue to lead us to tap into the power of the gospel every day of our life and have a relationship with you that leads to abundance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We invite you to stand and grab a hymnal. Turn to six.